welcome very much to this evening and thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're, we're really excited about tonight because it's a bit of a different thing for the London Hand Forum. We've got Matt who's very sweetly come from Jet Black and it's quite a vulnerable thing. He said it's the most women he's performed to ever because <laughs> he is in a heavy metal band and it's fairly male dominant. Quite isn't it? <laughs> so he's sipping on his straight vodka. No, it's water. And um, uh, Mark um, has made a little clip just to show some of the movements that Matt does and some of his other band members, um, just as a little intro, uh, which we'll play to you now. And um, then we're going to very much start talking all about what it is to be a musician, how it is to use your body in these ways. Um, the pressures on you, how to heal holistically, so what I do as a hand therapist and then looking more at what Graham does as a physiologist in terms of speeding up healing. So let's have a little look at, at um, Jet Black. So that gives you a little taste. Um, I can take your earplugs. They're, <laughs> they're a really exciting band. Lucy and I were thrilled to be invited, and we took Graham with us as our as our mascot. And we went to um, to Camden, which is a place that I used to go loads, and I don't really go anymore. And Lucy thought she was looking very rock chick, looking more cute chick than rock. And um, <laughs> I ended up with a shoe full of beer. Um, and at the end, we had a lovely hug from Matt, who was as sweaty as anything. Sorry, but it was a sorry. really fun gig, and, um, and their band's incredible. So if you get a chance to hear them, I really, I, th I think they're amazing. So the, the title of tonight is Jet Black, a Masterclass. And what we're going to do is look at Matt playing, look at um, how, he, how he practices, and talk a little bit about what he used to do and what he does now. Firstly, though, we'll look at who gets injuries in terms of musicians and how they get them and why they get them, how we assess, how we diagnose, some of the treatments we use. Then we'll look more particularly at Matt in terms of his condition, why he came to us and how we've helped him get back to playing. In fact, he's just returned from a tour Italy. last night, yeah. this morning. Four even. days, last Four night. Four days, and he's about to do a tour on, in April, 14 yeah. days. Yeah. So then looking more at physiological, and this might be some things that you've maybe thought about but haven't really dived into too much. Graham's a physiologist that we work with closely here, and he looks at how to optimise healing in terms of nutrition, diet, sleep patterns, and really helping work through some issues that maybe are stopping the mechanical and the muscular and all of the healing that we're trying to do happening. So he's going to then focus on that. Then we'll look at how you get musicians back playing after they've had a break from playing and practice techniques. And then I think the really useful part often in these evenings is the question and answer. So we're hoping to leave quite a long time for that. So Kit Wynn Parry uh, is just the most amazing man. He's actually why I moved from Australia to study with him 15 years ago. And he's now 94. And he's uh, an incredible doctor who has really made it his life mission to study performing arts and, and uh, the conditions that affect these artists. He himself has uh, analysed 1,046 musicians and he published this paper in 2004 where he was looking at what people present with. 52% present with non-specific arm pain. And this is an interesting thing. It's actually... Uh, are they just playing too much? Have they changed their instrument? Have they gone from being um, a college student where they were the best in their school to playing at the institute where they're one of many good people? Are they actually playing repertoire that's too hard for them? Are they not warming up? Are they sleeping incorrectly, etc.? Then 5% have focal hand dystonia, 9% hypermobility, 12% tenosynovitis, and 22% old injuries. 
Of these, the people that present more commonly are pianists and guitarists. And it's not that there's anything sinister with these instruments, it's just that these instruments are more commonly learnt and taught in schools. So 24% are pianists, 21% guitarists. Interestingly, with the guitarists, it's often that they're self-taught. So they're often young boys sitting on their bed for hours, playing with their pelvis forward, their wrists like this, playing for six to eight hours and really not leaving their bedroom and hardly washing. And, um, and then there's... That's um, not me. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, is, uh, <laughs> yeah. he has washed today, especially for the girls. But, um, and then violinists. And if you think of the violin, it is a really weird position. If you think of that hyper-supinated, and when you're playing in the higher positions, the hi hyper-flexion of the wrist, and then the complete wrist extension and pronation. So it's a very asymmetrical position that you're maintaining for hours and hours. And often they, they can have a lot of temporomandibular joint problems. They can have a lot of shoulder problems from shrugging if their shoulder rest and their chin rest aren't properly set up. So violin is particularly problematic, then cello, and then there's this big bank of others. And people, I think, tend to develop this most commonly because they have an increase in playing time or a change in technique. And it's interesting nowadays that people are more and more being allowed to use a technique that suits them, whereas in days gone by, when I was, was, was at the conservatorium, it was like, you will do this sort of tonguing technique because I am Zednik Bruderhans and this is what I do. Or this is, you know, I am this professor from Rome and, and this is how you play. Whereas now I think it's a lot more organic and people were knowing that if you're a small Japanese girl you are not going to be able to play Rachmaninoff like a great big Russian man. It's just not going to work out on the piano. So it's very interesting that that has developed and I do a lot of work with um, the universities looking at injury prevention, really looking at how to warm up, how to cool down, lecturing at places like Guildhall School of Music on their orientation week where you can really prevent these injuries from happening and that's the big focus. Encouragingly, not many people require surgery when it comes to musicians. Um, Ian Winsper and I did uh, research back in 2009 where we analysed 130 patients that he himself had operated on. So he was the only surgeon and of those patients that represented 4% of all the patients he's seen. So thankfully most musicians get away with not having surgery, which to them is pretty encouraging if you can give a diagnosis and if you can encourage them that they more than likely will not require surgery. Um, they're, they're pretty much uh, happy bunnies. 40% um, um, suffer technical problems, and this, this often is due to playing music that maybe is a little bit too challenging for them or music that is too quick, that they're trying to get too quick at too quickly, if you know what I mean. So rather than playing slowly, they're just trying to really ram it up and then they're playing with very tense muscles. And 19% suffer stress and anxiety. And interestingly, lots of people feel that they're not prepared for the stresses and the pressures of being a professional musician when they're at music college or when they're doing their training. Um, and we, we'll maybe speak to Matt about that later. So Matt's band is a really interesting band. They, they started playing when you were 15, is yeah, that right? Yeah, I think that's when and that that's them. was taken, to be honest. And um, <laughs> it's pretty... <laughs> Thanks for putting that it's, up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty rare, to be honest, to still be together 17 years later. Yeah. yeah. And I think... That's my mum's washing, just like that. <laughs> yeah. And... The interesting thing for, for me is that this band is still together and they're very close. They're almost, they're more than brothers really. They're very, very close friends. And they tour on a bus and they tour and they go around together like a gang. And it's interesting because um, quartets, I was speaking to, to a patient today who's a classical violinist. I was asking about the interactions with her quartet. And it's a very personal thing because you are with that person making music. So it's an emotional thing, it's a spiritual thing, it's a physical thing, and you're actually portraying part of you as a person to a large group of people who want a bit of you. So it's quite an intense thing being a musician because I was reading an interview that I've printed out um, that Matt uh, um, was interviewing. You, you might want to speak about that well, a little bit. I was bit. interviewing the best drummer in the world, a guy called Ian Pace from a band called Deep Purple. And yeah, he was just talking about, he's obviously been in the band for 40 years and he's been through so many different band members and he just said, you've got to learn when to walk away from each other because you know, you will mm. fall out, mm. probably on a daily basis, but you just need to know when to 
shut your mouth and keep yeah. quiet and leave leave people alone. Yeah. So and that that's a valuable tip. Really. Yeah. And I think it is, and this, this lady was saying the same, that actually her quartet's going through a very difficult time at the moment and they're, they're wondering whether they actually just part ways. And um, I, I think that that's, that's something that, that we can all, all learn from in terms of when we're treating these people, they are actually physically involved as well as involved spiritually and holistically as a person, which is what we're going to talk um, more about with Matt. So how is this um, athletes compared to musicians? I mean, how do you view an athlete? They train, they have a masseuse, they have a nutritionist, they have all these people looking after them. And musicians really don't have that. So they, they rarely know that the muscles here power their fingers. They think that if they've got finger pain, it's because there's something wrong with their finger. Um, if they've got pain here, it's because of pain there. They don't think that it could be their pelvis or the way they're sitting or the way they're sleeping. So it's very um, intriguing for people often to also then think about how their food impacts on them healing and I had a, a very interesting case where I had this very sweet girl she everything was pink she was a thrash punk she had pink hair wore pink tutus pink tights pink lipstick and she was very sweet little thing but actually she she was malnourished and she wasn't healing properly at all and I thought gosh this girl and this is before I'd met Graham this is in the last clinic and before before I thought She's just actually not getting better how I'd expect. And you know when you touch someone's muscles and you think this actually feels really unhealthy and really bad. And so I thought, hmm. And I didn't really know what to do other than I started talking to her a bit about her diet. And it turns out she, she ate white bread and jam and that was it. And she was basically really, she couldn't afford, she was having her treatment funded by a charity, musician's charity and she was malnourished. So I used to cook big meals the night before her treatment and I'd say, oh gosh, I've eaten my lunch and I've got so much left over. Would you like some? And surprisingly, she started getting better. And so it's, it was very interesting to me. But um, so the rapid complex coordinated movements, and we'll look at Matt playing in a moment, and how quickly they move. And if you think, sometimes these musicians are practicing six, eight, ten hours a day. Um, when I was at music college, I'd often do eight hours a day. It's quite normal for people to do 10, 12 hours practice a day not normal for their body, but normal for them. And they often think that they have to practice. Matt, you used to practice a lot more than you do now. I used to, but I never used to warm up for gigs. Yep. Either. So I'd go straight on stage, onto performance, launch into a, quite a technical piece of music, and all my arms would just seize up. But then you'd have to obviously try and get through it. So to get through it, you normally just drink alcohol to get through. <laughs> yeah. Which, Which is isn't also good. About. <laughs> yes. um. And also you're often performing to the limits of your abilities. So like sports people, you're, you're doing it repetitively, you're doing it for a long length of time. You can often be doing it in a very noisy environment or very cold or very hot. So if you're at a festival or if you're in an orchestra pit where you're really crammed. And um, I've got a, another patient at the moment who really can't stand their desk partner. So if you're sitting and um, say in the Royal Opera, uh, it's not the Royal Opera, by the way, but if you're sitting there and it's quite a small place and you hate your desk partner, what do you do? If you're a violinist, you probably go like this and you twist your neck because you don't want to actually be near them if you don't like their sound or if you think they're a nasty person. And it can be quite childlike, but that's what happens if you're in this <coughs> confined place for ages and ages. And um, there's really quite often a limited access to masseuses or to anyone to help with the physical ailments. The Konshokibau Orchestra in Amsterdam have their own doctor and um, the Sydney Symphony has a physio that's on tap. So orchestras are beginning to do it, but it's certainly not commonplace. And less than ideal postures we've already <coughs> talked about. So playing the flute's pretty abnormal, playing the bassoon for long lengths of time. So you're sustaining quite strange postures. And then alcohol, drugs, the, the fact that this is often, uh, more, more so often also in classical circles. I remember um, going to gigs and things and afterwards there'd just be trays and you think they're smarties but they're just every pill you can imagine on this table. You're thinking, wow, okay, I've just heard Beethoven and now this is presented, you know, so it's not always rock. And interestingly, this, um, this was quite surprising to me. Uh, at a conference that, uh, that I was at in October last year, the, the most hearing damage that is experienced is in classical orchestras in the pit. 
So um, the, the, the sound has nowhere to go other than into your ears. And so there's, there's quite a few cases at the moment, um, sadly, of people having permanent hearing loss due to playing in orchestra pits for, for opera orchestras. So how do we assess these musicians? It's, it's more holistic maybe than when you get someone who comes in for a mallet finger, for example. So if, if a musician has a mallet finger, yes, you assess them and treat them as though they have a mallet, but what are they trying to get back to? So you look at their whole body. You also look at any deformities or past medical um, history. You always assess on the instrument, because certain things like hypermobility you mightn't see unless they're doing the, the, the um, item, you know, the playing the violin or playing the flute. Instrument history, have they changed their instruments? So have they gone from gut strings on the violin to metal strings? Or have they gone from playing the viol de gamba to the, to the cello? Or have they gone from playing um, like a, a violinist I saw yesterday? She's got a new violin and the neck of the violin is just slightly, slightly bigger. And it's causing her wrist pain because she's very, very slight. So have they had a change in their instrument? Uh, Nancy, uh, sorry, not Nancy Bill, um, Alice Branfenbrenner has done a lot of research <coughs> in the US looking at correlations between hypermobility and hand and arm pain, and there's a strong correlation. So we always look at the bite and score, look at um, are, are they a bit bendier everywhere or are they just bendy in certain joints, and what's the impact of this? Providing a diagnosis is essential if you can, because Musicians tend to think it's always the worst. So my sister's got a bit of an itchy thing on her side. Yesterday, she now thinks she's got chicken pox. The other day, she had something, a bit of a headache. She thought she had MS. So, you know, it's, they, they often do think, I mean, it's true, isn't it? You often yeah, think it that it's the worst thing and that they'll never play again. And that's always the thing. Will I ever play again? Or is this going to be the end of my career? Instigating treatment as soon as possible is um, also integral when treating the musician, I think when treating anyone, but also with the musician if they can't work, then they can get very depressed, then they have all the financial constraints, etc. And returning to the instrument, so if someone, for example, has broken their wrist, can they, and they're a violinist, they mightn't be able to get into this position, but can you have them just play it like a guitar? Or can they just practice their bowing in the air? Or can they just practice holding it there and just playing a little bit down here? So how can you get them relating to their instrument again? Because for many musicians, the instrument's almost an extension of their body. So if you um, get them relating to their instrument, it really helps with their healing. So even just shadow playing, which I think we did with you initially, where, where you're just doing some very simple movements. Uh, um, jazz drummer that I'm working with at the moment, he can't, uh, because of his surgery, we're, we're not allowing him to do this movement. So we're just setting him up and he's doing loads of footwork. So he's getting all his feet and his left hand going. But he's just doing very gentle cymbal work um, with the right side and then coming out a little bit more. And so we're just grading it. The treatments are all the ones that we know and love. So they're the ones that we use for every patient in hand therapy educating them that a tendinopathy is going to take a very long time to heal rather than two days, ice compression, electrotherapy, splinting, sensory re-education, postural re-education, acupuncture, injections if required, a lot of ergonomic advice and it's often looking at how to hold the instrument, so what we call the interface, so how their body's relating to the instrument and if that needs changing, either if we need to strengthen their body or adjust their posture or if in fact we need to adjust the instrument by putting um, extension to the keys on or by covering up the open holes on a flute etc. Biomechanical considerations, relax relaxation training, um, we, we often look a lot at um, intercostal diaphragmatic breathing and breath control, myofascial release, nerve glides and surgery. So here we have Matt and Matt came um, to us pretty much a year ago actually, unable to play at all mm. with a two year history of, of increasing arm pain. So much so that he, he had um, pins and needles up the ulnar distribution both sides. It initially started with thumb pain, didn't yeah. it? Um, and then when he came to us, he was, he was in a bit of a pickle really because he, he couldn't play. He'd had to dep out one of your tours, hadn't mm. you? 
And um, his grip strength, I've, I've written it down here, I think it was in less than the 10th percentile. Um, he'd been working as a builder as well. Yes, so he was 32 kilos, um, so less than 10th percentile for his um, age and sex. And um, he'd been doing building work really to supplement his income, whereas now he's doing more photographic and working with your brother more... Um, in uh, graphics retouching. and retouching. So do you want to talk a little bit about why you came to us and how you felt when you first well, when presented? I, when I first had the problem, as you said, it started off in my thumbs. So I, I couldn't really move my thumb from there to there, basically. And to try and get around that, I was doing different exercises and trying to play with different parts of my body and grip the sticks a bit differently which worked to a degree, but then of course the problem moves up my arm, up the forearm and then eventually to the elbows, so I had the problems in the elbows and sorry, thanks. Um, and the uh, tingling in the fingers, so <coughs> I was kind of back to square one and I couldn't grip the sticks again, so mm. that's when I came to see you. Yeah. yeah, and we, when we first assessed um, Matt, it was on the 18th of March. You weren't able to play, you were pretty no. down about it. You could barely do any life tasks in terms mm. of cooking. And I was very nervous at doing anything like picking anything up or brushing my teeth, even washing my hair, lifting my hands up to wash my hair was a bit of a chore. So, yeah, yeah. pretty bad place. So then we, we then um, assessed Matt and it turned out that he, his main concerns were pins and needles, weakness, decreased ability to play the drums and this pain that was increasing and spreading up the arms. He scored four out of nine on the Byton score with hypermobility noted in the, in the um, fingers and in the elbows, which is quite usual actually and Rodney Graham's done a lot of work looking into hypermobility with musicians and they're often not hypermobile globally but they might be hypermobile in certain joints. And um, you can imagine if you're a drummer and you're hypermobile in your elbows, if you're repetitively going out like this, you can imagine the impact up to the neck and down to the arms. And then if you're also gripping a small stick for hours and hours and practicing really rapid movements, you can imagine the impact on the intrinsic muscles and then right, right through up the chain. He was also really weak in his intrinsics, which isn't surprising. Seeing later, um, we had a few problems getting his nerve conduction studies done. The GP and the um, hospital weren't massively cooperative. <laughs> and um, yeah, well, he didn't have, yeah, it was all a bit uncoordinated. And unfortunately, it took uh, March, April, May, June. Yeah, it took about three months for us to get the nerve conduction studies done, which in fact did then show that he had ulnar neuropathy, which is what we were treating him for anyway. But um, and another big thing that was interesting was, just show us how you slept. Ah, okay. <laughs> what, on the floor? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I always used to sleep with my hands like that and my head on my hands. Yeah. Always. And that's how I, could, he slept. I couldn't fall asleep unless I. And often was in Renee that would shove you up against the wall and lie yeah. on your arms if you yeah, were. Yeah. Basically, yeah. So, so it was pretty unusual sleeping posture, and um, he had a very positive wrist flexion test and lots of tenderness around the common flexor origin, and so basically we then um, we met and I, I remember it, it was. It was a very typical presentation where he was very nervous. His girlfriend came with him and I think he, he didn't know what to do. His arms were painful, he couldn't do basic things and it was spreading and he just stepped out his tour. So we started very gently teaching forearm stretches and with these, um, we were talking about these before, it's really important you don't take the patient into their hypermobile range. So you just want to show how you do your, yep, so he holds his elbow in slight wrist flexion, uh, sorry, his elbow oh, wow. in 15 degrees flexion. He pulls no more than 90 degrees on the back of his hand. And then just to, and then the flexor one where he's holding in the palm, elbow 15 degrees flexion as well. And the thing is, you'll often see that patients think 
that they will be doing themselves favours by pulling on the ends of the fingers and really hyperextending. And I always say to them that that's as bad as not stretching because you're taking your tissues too far. I used to bend each finger right back. Yeah, and it's really well. common. Musicians so. do all sorts of weird things and up against the wall where they're taking their shoulder into really unusual postures. And I say that it's not a stretch, it's more, more a maintenance. So that they know that if, if they're holding that, they're maintaining the length of their muscles rather than stretching. And I often use the analogy that it's like brushing your teeth with a toothbrush versus brushing it with a stick. You know, yeah, if you brush it really hard with a stick, you'll hurt your gums. If you brush it with a toothbrush gently, you'll stop cavities from forming. And they tend to understand that because it's, um, it's interesting. They often want to heal themselves so much that they can do themselves damage in so doing. So we started very gentle stretches. Actually, I think with, with Matt, without any of the overpressure initially, just literally just going into a position and holding and into the position because he was so sensitive initially. Then some self-massage at home and also we did a lot of soft tissue massage, Lucy and, and I worked um, together on Matt. Uh, heat packs at home, sleeping retraining where we really looked at how he could retrain this posture rather than completely having his neck on traction and, and Which I'm lying. still struggling with. Yeah, and we used the elbow pads and we used all uh, wrist splints and things, but it's, it's hard, especially when you go to bed, and we'll talk about Matt's sleep habits later. Um, and <laughs> he's terrified Brilliant. and his eating habits. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then a graded return to play, and this was where we literally started really looking at. And should we should we get the the, yeah. um, the yeah. sort of setup? This is a bit of a, a mock setup because Matt's actual um, kit is very heavy, and it looks a bit different to this. It looks very different. So he practices um, when when he's actually practicing Aerobics. at home. He practice you practice Matt on a electric kit I at do, home. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a bit more civilised for the neighbours than having... So he plugs himself in and he'll practice on that. Basically, they'll still talk to me. I'll use that. Whereas, um, obviously, he's fully... You're fully... Um, acoustic. Acoustic. Kit. Yeah. yeah. And then here, this... Often they'll just bring in a practice pad, so it's literally just... What is it? It's just a heavy rubber... It's just a piece of rubber, basically. Yeah. It's not too dissimilar to this. Yeah. A bit harder. So do you just want to show us some... So there's many different grips... So you've got a match grip. Yeah, this is the match grip, and whenever I'm warming up, I'll just sit down and literally start really slowly, and then eventually build the pace up. But I'll do this probably for about 15 minutes or half to half an hour. And, just and doing different well. rhythms. Um, I or maybe just I kind of just start like that and then literally just speed up. Yeah. And then do a few doubles, and then twiddle the sticks around a few times. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's essential really. So. And can you can you explain the difference? So there's match grip. You've got the match grip, which is the overarm grip like this. Yeah. And most drummers will play like that, but then you've got the traditional grip where the stick goes through the fingers there, and it's kind of like that. And interestingly, I was speaking to another drummer, a patient of mine, and he said that that was often in the military bands. That yeah, you'd, the military you'd, bands would do it. Do a lot because more because the that, drums yeah. at the side. So there's a whole lot, and you've got I'm, the under grip and the over grip. Yeah, you, I mean for for. For kind of heavier drumming like rock and metal, which is what we do, it's better to have that grip and it doesn't look as silly. It feels like you're, eat <laughs> feels like you're eating your dinner if you've kind of got like that. <laughs> so, yeah. so do you want to just show us some of the different rhythms that you do? Well, as I say, I, I normally start off with single rolls, which is just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then I just build the pace up. And then I do the doubles. Yeah, and you've got to think that there's also the feet going also yeah, with that. Yeah, feet, so I'll, I'll be doing the, the, the bass pedal as well. So when Matt first came to us, he played mainly from his wrist, and he was really hinging. So um, he literally would play more like this. Well, what I was doing is I was actually gripping the sticks far too tightly, so I was kind of playing like that. And when you've had no warm-up as well, and you just launch into a performance, you're completely rigid. 
So now, now I've now I've warmed up. I let the, the sticks are very loose. So I, I well, Catherine yeah. probably say now why yeah. they're loose. Yeah. Just ask, was that are you a self-taught drummer? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was self-taught, but I did have after about four years, I had a couple of lessons. Yep. And the guys did say you, 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 you need kind of, technique. but it's it, but it's impossible to do because when you're on stage, you've got all all the nerves and yeah. you've had a few you beers and well, you, you never warm up because you're talking to somebody and then somebody says, oh, you're supposed to be on stage. So you just run up there and think, oh god, I've got no time to warm up, and you just go straight out. And so where do you warm up now? Well. Sorry? You warm up in the green. I always warm up now, um, apart from the last gig, Whitley, <laughs> which was... Which didn't go so well. But that, the only reason that is because it was a really weird venue. It was some random restaurant in Italy, and there was literally nowhere to warm up. So yeah. I wasn't going to warm up in front of the crowd because it just looks a bit stupid. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's, that's But actually what that I did, I say I didn't warm up, but I went for a jog around the venue. And then I came in and that was fine. So, yeah. Also, um, you've, you've been using a triplet glove? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, apart from you and Lucy, this has probably saved my career at the minute. Um, because this, this has helped me to actually hold the drumsticks again. Cause it's, got three, it's got three loops through the glove. So... And it's for different um, stages of, of injury, I guess, depending on how serious you are. But you, you can just pop it through that, that one loop and it will always kind of hold it. It will fall out eventually. But then if, if you're a little bit worse, you can go through the second. And it's the same. But if you're really bad, which is when I first got this glove and this actually got me through the main tour, you can put it through all three loops and then I don't even have to hold the stick. So I just go like that. <laughs> and it looks a bit weird and it's it's a bit of a nightmare if you snap a stick because it's stuck on there <laughs> then you have to work out how to flip it out <laughs> so you, you look a bit of an idiot trying to get it out but um yeah as i say that that definitely got me through one of the tours when i was really bad and you're yeah. the builder Sorry, are those so, therapeutic gloves or they no they're, uh, they're, yeah. they're actually drum proper drumming gloves yeah, yeah. and the guy yeah. designed it to to make people hold the stick correctly initially oh, really? Because the way the stick's angled, you're supposed to kind of hold it in this, along the line of your arm. Yeah. That's what he designed it for. But then he realised that this could actually help, help a lot people. of people. Yeah. And it's saved a lot of drummers' careers. So. A lot of my drummers are using it. You can use it as a retraining device. So you don't have to always then use it. But it, it really helps relax the grip. And what we were looking at with Matt was really using a lot more shoulder um, motion so that he gets more power through using shoulder and elbows to so the larger joints rather than just sort of either using a whole sort of stiff arm or mm. very tight grip with the intrinsics. Also, um, you've built up the, the sides of the um, yeah, stick. Yeah, I've, I've started to put um, tennis racket grip around the stick as well, which as, obviously makes the diameter a bit thicker, but it actually, the grip's amazing and um, yeah, just tends to stick to your hand a bit better. But of course, if you use that with the glove as well, it's kind of double. Yeah. Double the benefits, really. Also, increasing the size, like we know from all our joint protection, is meaning that you're offloading the intrinsics and there's less muscle force being used. So, so then we went also on to um, using rock tape, and this really helped. We, we got some pretty funky rock tape, actually. It was uh, there's a there's a um, picture later on of Matt with it on, and it's. Well, you you found the um, skulls and Skull and wing bones, yeah. Yeah, so Pe that was quite people, funky. Most people thought I was trying to make a fashion statement with this, but in actual fact, it was. But it helped, and and we've been using rock tape more and more. Lucy and I did a course back in October last year, and and it can really help people just change their proprioception, change the way that they're relating to the object that they're trying to get back mm. to doing, so whether it's typing or playing a musical instrument or playing golf. Sorry, Catherine, what is rock tape? Um, it's a, it's, 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 it's like yeah, it's like, like it, right. but they say it's not, if you know what I mean, it's, yeah. If we've got some here, I'll, find, I'll dig it out when Graham's talking. I've got, I've got a little, is it on here? There should be, oh, here we go. Yeah, that's some of the, so it's, it's more stretchy, basically, and less stiff than Kinesio tape. And then we also looked at uh, lifestyle modifications, which Graham's going to look at in a moment. 
So where, where we're at now, I think we'll, we'll wait until Graeme's, maybe now we can have Graeme come up oh, and, and talk <laughs> That's a terrible about picture. That, that. I didn't put that there. Um, so should we move this aside? Have we finished yep. showing? Yeah, move this aside. Do you want to have a look at with and without the grip as well? Should we, can we hand that yep. around? Yeah. Thank you, pardon? No, no, there's, no. There's loads of different sizes. There's loads, and uh, it's kind of a bit of experimentation with it. So I've tried every stick going, to be honest. Um, I used to think the smaller, the thinner the stick, the lighter it was, the better I would be because I wouldn't have to do so much and it wouldn't be that heavy. But in actual fact, it's kind of chill. in actual fact, it's kind of the opposite way around because the stick's heavier, the stick will do more of the work for you. So okay. So what I'm going to talk about is accelerating the recovery and healing process through some uh, through changing lifestyle and behaviours. So um, hopefully today you're going to get a bit of an in insight into Matt's lifestyle. I'm not looking forward to this bit. <laughs> Buckle yourself in. Um, and then uh, what I do is by understanding people people's lifestyle, I uh, I prescribe behavioural changes uh, revolving around things like diet, sleep patterns, stress management. It may be helping to improve their digestive system and um, just to help their body function better. So I used to work for Nuffield Health and I ran the health assessment department at the Southampton Nuffield Hospital and I worked alongside GPs and other physiologists and prescribed again behavioural change, lifestyle changes um, to help to address things that arose as part of their assessment. So it may be they had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, it might be that they were just you know, generally quite stressed out, they might have had irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so I worked in accordance with the GP who would prescribe any medication, would recommend any further testing, and then I would try and get to the, the root, you know, the potential root cause of the problem um, through assessing their behaviour and lifestyle. <coughs> My approach is that I break the body down into four key different systems. So we've got the organ system, the muscle and bone system, the emotional system, and the hormonal system. Now, of course, most of the patients come in to see you and us, they've, they've got a problem in the muscle and bone system. And it's, it's not very often or not too often where the emotional, hormonal, and organ system will be considered. But how I often explain it to them is that in order for the muscle and bone system to have the energy it needs to rest, recover and regenerate, the emotional, the hormonal and the organ system have got to be functioning as good as possible. So what I'm trying to understand is where, where is there stress in these other three systems and how can that be influencing the muscle and bone system? Uh, so the, the question is why, you know, why do we want to reduce stress levels? And one of the, the easiest ways of understanding this is looking at the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system has got two sides to it. It's like a background computer in the body. It's got an accelerator side, or the sympathetic nervous system, and that secretes a lot of breakdown hormones. And then on the opposite side to that, we've got the parasympathetic nervous system, or the, the rest and relaxation part to that branch. Uh, and these work together to help your body to go throughout its daily tasks. Now back when we were hunter-gatherers, the sympathetic nervous system, if you were being attacked by a wild animal or you had to hunt for your food, that would kick into gear and change things like how, how quickly our heart rate um, how quickly our heart rate beats, how, how, you know, how quickly we breathe, and it would essentially turn on everything that's essential for survival and turn off everything that's not. So things like your digestive function would get, um, that would be postponed until a later point till that stress was over. So the key is what I'm trying to understand is with every patient that's coming in, um, how much you know, stress is in their, in their life and try to reduce the amount of sympathetic nervous system drive because that's over a long period of time, not necessarily a short period because again, um, if you are trying to run for your life, then you want that system to be working and functioning well. But we're trying to stop that being activated too much over a long period 
because that will cause more of a, a, cata, um, a catabolic or breakdown state within the physiology and the tissues. So typically, when you talk to anyone about stress, they, they, um, they think purely about the, the mental emotional side, which is, comes under this, this psychic aspect here. Um, but I consider these are the, these are the five uh, aspects as well. So you can get you know, there can be physical stress, chemical stress, electromagnetic, um, psychic that we've already just mentioned, nutrition and thermal. Now, it is important to understand that the body does need some stress to be in order to be able to survive. Um, you know, if you've got not, you know, for example, an astronaut going to, into space doesn't get any physical stress from gravity, and their body breaks down at that point as well. So there's got to be some. You know, we've got to have stress in our lives, but we don't want too much of it for too long a period of time. Now, one of one of the keys of the why, why I like this diagram is that the fact that. The body, whether or not you experience a, a physical stress, so that's an injury, or you experience a, a mental emotional stress, or a, a, you know, a thermal stress, it still has the same physiological and biochemical response within your system. You're still going to get um, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So when we look at and consider stress, you have to try and consider all these different aspects, these different six things because the body will summate those um, and too many of those, again, it's going to lead to this greater catabolic state. So these, we experience these stresses, we have different control systems that enable us to process these stresses, but too much of them and we become, uh, the body becomes more symptomatic and also our tolerance for exercise will, um, will decrease. So the more stress in the body, you know, quite a key thing or something to, um, to be aware of and it's something that we often see a lot particularly in, in, in London is that you know, people will have a lot of symptoms, they'll be feeling tired, they've got pain, they've got a lot of uh, mental emotional stresses and they'll go to the gym and just hammer it out on the treadmill and they'll you know, really push their body too hard and all that's doing is adding further stress to the system. So what we um, so just the key is to try and understand and look at these different stresses um, and trying to start to address these in the lifestyle and ultimately you know get that better balance within the autonomic nervous system. Um, so how do we know how much stress is actually being placed through the control systems? Um, and this is actually Matt's questionnaire that you filled out for me. Do you want to talk a little bit about the question? You cursed me, didn't you, after the, the <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the shower thing? No. No, <laughs> no that long questionnaire. The, the long that? questionnaire. I can't remember it. Um, <laughs> hang on. Ah. Do you remember all the circle one you had to yes, circle? Yes, yes, yes. I did, yeah. Uh, so this is it's called a health appraisal questionnaire and it's got all the different control systems at the top that we can see here and it, it, what it does it highlights them in low, moderate uh, or high priority so the, the more scores we've got in high priority basically the more stress through the body as a whole so I find this is a really good subjective tool not only to gauge if you like physiological what I call physiological load or overall stress in the system but it can also highlight specific areas that we need to address to get the, you know, the, the optimal result. Um, so one of the first things that cropped up was you know, potential with max circulation. Uh, and this is, as you can see, it's bordering right on high priority. Uh, so I've then given him, <laughs> given him a, a little task that did you want to explain a bit more he, about He gave it? me a task that was tantamount to torture, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Having a shower, a hot a hot shower, as, as hot as you can get it, and then as cold as you can get it. So, and I did that. For, well, I've been doing it ever since. Have you? Um, and my neighbours can hear the screams. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's but it works. It's horrible, yeah. but it does work. So the first thing I wanted to try and do is see can I improve mat circulation, and simply by exposing him to that hot cold, um, it helps to relax and constrict the blood vessels. And if you think about it, nowadays we don't really experience, although you could argue this at the moment with the amount of cold weather that we're having, but we don't get a lot of thermal stress. We kind of wake up in our nice 
warm beds and then we go downstairs to a warm kitchen or wherever that is we go. Then we typically get into the warm car and blast the heater up. So we don't, uh, you know, then we get into the office and it'll be a nice warm environment again. So often our, our, our circulatory systems don't get challenged as much as they would when we were hunter-gatherers and, and exposed to kind of um, hot and cold more on a daily basis. Um, so as we can also see, he's got uh, some challenge, you know, his musculoskeletal system is in high priority and that's for most of the patients that are actually coming through. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, again, it's looking through, can we do anything additional to, to help to um, reduce strain on the musculoskeletal system? So I'm actually, have you got the magnesium flakes? I have got, got them, them, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I also asked Matt to do was to, to get some magnesium flakes and you can have a good, you, know, you put them in the bath and then you have a good soak in a nice warm bath and the body will uptake that magnesium which is needed for muscle relaxation. Um, and if we look into Matt's diet a bit more, you know, there's, there's a little bit of alcohol consumed. Not, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, not now, <laughs> apart from this. I know it looks bad. But <laughs> yeah, it's holding a glass. It's not what it looks like. Yeah. Um, so when, and, and when we drink alcohol, it will deplete magnesium levels, um, and it will deplete things like B vitamins, which are needed for energy. So it's just trying to, you know, Matt's, he's not necessarily going to stop drinking, so it's trying to give him some tools that can help to you know, address an area without having to say, right, Matt, you need to give up alcohol, which... Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, well, you saying, saying that, yeah. saying that, I don't drink alcohol on tour anymore. Never. Yeah. So. Good and before yeah. you did, and I'm, I think you were saying to me that you used to play and you're, you'd go on stage after drinking a mm. bit and your muscles would get tighter and tighter and more and more It's sore. amazing the difference and once, the you've, yeah, you feel once terrible. you've drunk. It would, the pain would be twice as bad if I'd been drinking alcohol. So now when I'm on tour, I don't drink alcohol. I know I'm drinking it now, but it's obviously because I haven't got a gig tonight. <laughs> but if I did, I would not be drinking. So. And you've noticed yeah. a big difference. Oh, it's a massive you? difference, yeah. 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 That's often yeah, also I talk to my patients about that where, because, you know, they're, they're rock musicians, they're playing in pubs, so it's, it's sort of equates, it's like my mm. brother's about, you know, he runs a bar, is he going to drink? Yes, he drinks. But it's also how, how can you get around that? So can you have a glass of water every glass of beer? Or can you have just an off day? Or can you have lots of water before you go on stage? But early enough so that you pee so you don't have to pee in the middle of a gig and mm. you know it's all about planning these things so that so that you're up taking water as well as wine if you're if you're still drinking wine or having just rules where you don't drink on tour and lots of people do have rules like that but one thing i have noticed is that even if you say you're not drinking like this is a typical example of the gig we did yesterday in italy we did the gig and the the venue and the promoter were really happy with it they said right come down got the whole band in front of everyone in the pub and poured all the shots out. And so we're there, you know, everyone's cheering, going, yeah, you drink, drink, drink. And what, what would you do? So, I mean, I knocked mine over, luckily. <laughs> but whenever you do that, they just fill it up again. So it's not easy. Well, you said sometimes you tip them, you just Usually tip them Usually I tip them away, yeah. yeah. But in that scenario, I couldn't get away with it, yeah. so I did have a shot then. But one shot's fine, because, you know. Is that, all, is that all right, one shot? Yeah, that's all right. That's Thank all right. you. <laughs> <laughs> so also we can do some objective testing to establish the, uh, the balance of his autonomic nervous system. Uh, I use a device called Nerve Express. And what this does is it analyzes uh, heart rate variability. And this is actually Matt's heart rate variability here on the left hand side. So what we can see is this is time difference between beats of the heart and every one of these little strips here uh, is measuring that exact time. So he, he averages just below about uh, a beat every second but we can see there's quite a bit of variability there. And that's what the parasympathetic system does. So that actually promotes um, good heart rate variability and it will, um, you know, from this, from this graph we can see that 
and note that you know this is actually very positive from a cardiovascular health perspective and for his body in, in, in terms of actually recovering. If we just look at uh, another example, we can, can see the, the complete difference. So just looking on the left, we can see it's a much faster heart rate. There's very little variability there. And if we look at the graph on the right-hand side, you can see these, these dots up here. The blue one's the one I'm most interested in. So we've got the sympathetic nervous system on the vertical axis, the parasympathetic on the horizontal axis, and you, you want to see uh, a balance between the two. As we can see here, this other patient, they had a level of plus four sympathetic nervous system activity and minus three parasympathetic. So there's a real imbalance there in their autonomic nervous system. And what that's going to mean is they're going to be secreting a lot more breakdown hormones and, and to, you know, pushing their body more into this catabolic state, which we want to avoid. So just go back to um, Matt's quickly. So we can see the difference here. Matt's actually um, plus, uh, plus one parasympathetic function. Anything between minus one and plus one is considered within normal limits. But as long as there's you know, balance between the two, that's what we're looking for. So he could be plus two, plus two. Uh, and generally the more, what you tend to see is the more athletic someone is, the more actual sympathetic and parasympathetic function they will, they will get. Uh, so we can see you know, some, some professional athletes will be up maybe plus three, plus three. Um, but good result from Matt here indicates that he's got you know, a much better chance. His physiology is more directed to a balanced state and therefore he's uh, got a, a better chance of rest and, uh, and recovering and regeneration within his tissues. So to, to really summarise, what I try and do is just identify which systems are under the greatest load through objective and subjective means, and then work to re reduce those stresses and rebalance the autonomic nervous system to, to promote more of a, an anabolic in environment so that the tissues can actually recover and regenerate. And you, you looked at um, some of Matt's diet as well. Yeah, you've got you don't some need diet. to talk about that. You've got some <laughs> diet sheets. Where did I, did I put Are these yours? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's, where, 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 where did you start? start? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if we start, um, I mean, I just I like, like the way to, I haven't got any in this paper. If you look at the, if you look at Matt's, not you've got a normal day one, which is in blue. I mean, is there anything obvious that you pick up straight away from that? If I throw this out to everyone in the audience, sweets for breakfast. Packet of sweets for breakfast. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> Yeah, anything else? I was also looking at the uh, quarter past two. Shit, that was bad. <laughs> quarter past two, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait till we get that. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's one of the, the first things that I look at is just the regularity of meals um, and what actually the quality of those meals. And we can see that. He's got things, I mean, is it white bread, Matt, that you eat? Are you a bit of a wholemeal man or grand? I'll mix it up, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I like to mix Keep it, it up. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I mean, the first thing is that his, his breakfast is, it's very carbohydrate dominant. He's got toast, porridge, and a, a packet of sweets. Um, so he's just, <laughs> he's really... He's Fruit pastels. <laughs> He's, he's setting himself up for uh, some quite significant nutritional stress very soon after that. Yeah. Um, steak and ale pie, not, I mean, he's getting some protein in there. And protein's really important because it helps to uh, slow the blood sugar response, so it keeps the blood sugar much more stable. But um, the more sort of high glycemic load, so the more sugary a food is, or the quicker it turns to sugar in the body, the more likely he's going to get a blood sugar crash. Uh, and that's going to then, once you're getting a blood sugar crash, what happens is the adrenal glands, which secrete your stress hormones, and the, um, the sympathetic nervous system, they have to kick in to help to raise the blood sugar. So uh, he's also skipped, I mean, he's, he's, he's eating at 
in the in the <laughs> afternoon, and then he's gone all the way until 1:30 in the morning uh, without anything else as well. So um, not not the <laughs> could be improved. <laughs> so you want to just try and get get you know, just looking at this, just try and get him eating a bit more regular. And yeah, definitely the packet of sweets. We try and move that out. And then if we could exchange, you know, probably remove the porridge out and get him having a couple of eggs with his, his piece of toast and some and uh, a little bit of butter, that is going to be a much better start to the day um, to help to keep his blood sugar balanced and reduce stress on his, you know, some of this nutritional stress. Uh, three also things just could do with definitely drinking a bit more water. It's something that we've talked about. Mm. Um, again, if he's dehydrated, it's just again it's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. So we just want to try and avoid that uh, as well. If we go to uh, on tour use uh, what he used to do, and then if you put on tour now kind of next to it, so we can look at these two together. But Matt, do you think you're do you think you're eating? You think you're eating better now, or? I don't know. I'm, I'm waiting for you to reveal. <laughs> to be honest, um, I become obsessed with eating raw carrots and celery because I think that's what you should do. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's, there's there's some good and bad things on on both of these. I think definitely eating raw carrots and celery. I mean, it's going to help to get some really good good quality um, you know some good quality vegetables in that haven't been through through the cooking process so there's more nutrients in mm. there he'll be, he'll be getting good antioxidant levels from that which can help to fight inflammation in his tissues um, but the the thing with his his previous meals definitely you know, when he's getting things like a fried breakfast he's getting although it's probably not the the healthiest way to eat fat and protein he was getting more of that. You know, when I looked through your food diaries, mm. there's definitely some some good things in there in the sense that you're yeah. getting more protein earlier on in the day. Um, we can see, and again, he's missed his missed his noon meal here, um, and then it's just things like he's getting he's getting honey roasted peanuts. So probably it, again, it's not the not the best, but it's he's going to have some good. You know, there's going to be some fat in there that's going to help to keep his blood sugar more balanced. So there's definitely a halfway house between these two where he can, you know, he's getting good quality carbohydrate, but again, with some protein and fat. So if he was having celery sticks, you could do it with some hummus, or you could do it, you know, you could do like raw carrots and, and nuts. Not hummus. <laughs> so we can, but what we can do is start to explore things that, that Matt is going to actually eat, um, try and get some of the, the bad things out and keep his blood sugar a bit more balanced Again, to reduce this, uh, you know, reduce this overall. The, um, the problem is on tour, stress. you're kind of at the mercy of the uh, venues as well, because a lot of it is in-house catering, so it's kind of whatever they put on the table. And a lot of that, depend if you're in Europe, a lot of it's just very carb-heavy. So it's always pasta, or it's a pizza, or it's a load of chips, and you, you don't really have much option. So you just eat it. Yeah. I mean, it's tricky. It's either doing your research, your, your research while you're there, and finding places where you can mm. pick some things up. Um, you know, it might be that you get you just found a, a, quite a lot of Parma ham while you're there, and just stocked up on that a little bit to to actually you know use as a protein snack, or it's taking you know being able to take snacks with you. So some things mm. that when you are struggling for protein, for example, that you can then reach into this kind of goodie bag that I'm sure he'd thank me for in his suitcase. Well, I've, I've become obsessed, <laughs> me and the guitar player have become obsessed with eating everything raw, so we'll, we'll go into the supermarket and just get broccoli, raw and chicken. we'll just munch through that and pretend it's a chocolate bar. <laughs> Hope not. Not yet. <laughs> it's probably on the car, so. it. <laughs> um, so there are, there are ways, it is difficult when you're, you're, going, you know, you're going away and it's working with what you've got. Um, but it's probably, Matt and I are going to definitely sit down and sort of explore some, explore some options in more detail that we can kind of reach uh, some kind of compromise whereby you know, helping, helping him and his recovery and his body, um, but it's not too difficult for him to do as well. It's interesting what you were saying to me about 
ideal sleep times and going to bed at 10 and waking at 6 a.m. is the best <coughs> time for healing. Do you want to explain a bit more about it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if you think back to when we didn't have, we, did, we, you know, we, we didn't have electricity, we would have lived you know, typically by the, the light, we would have lived by the light, the natural light dark cycles. Um, so the sun will, will go down around, you know, for example, 8 o'clock, and when the sun goes down and we're not exposed to that light, it means our stress hormone production is decreased. So we naturally get this kind of decline in stress hormone, uh, stress hormone release, that then means the repair hormones are able to increase, we're able to go to bed, rest and repair. What I typically find is that the later people will go to bed, so even if they're going to bed, say, at 12 o'clock and having eight hours sleep, um, you know, if they've played on the laptop or their iPhone, they're still going to be, be, be exposed to this, this light um, that's going to stimulate cortisol production in the body. Cortisol's got quite a long half-life, so it's going to take a couple of hours to actually be removed out of the system completely. So the quality of the sleep actually is quite poor. Um, so the closer, what I find is the closer people can go to bed and actually get to sleep around the 10 o'clock mark, um, the more restful sleep, the better recovery they will actually get. So if we look at Matt's sleep, uh, so he's 2.13am, 4am, 3am. The problem is, 10 o'clock, you've only just got to the venue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So and you're so not on stage the... till 12 or 1 in Europe. Yeah. yeah. And then you're not going back to bed till 4.30. Mm. Yeah. It's, so it's, I mean, and this is the, the thing show. that loads of musicians, they'll, they'll get off the flight and they'll get to the hotel and the restaurant's closed. So what they have, gin and tonic and some nuts. And that's their dinner. Yeah. And then the, they're up for the rehearsal and before the breakfast is being served. Do you know what I mean? And so all these things are ideal. Give you a typical can't... example. For, we got back from the venue at 430 in Italy, went to bed, woke up at 6.30, went to the airport, and everyone said, oh, what should we do? We've got to wait four hours for the flight. We'll have a few beers. Mm. So, and, you know, and then yeah. it's I mean, just all over the show. Yeah, it's, it's try, the key, I mean, we'd be try, when he's actually back here, he's in, his, he's in some kind of normal routine, would be to try and normalise his sleeping pattern as much as possible. And, and then also, the more he's going to get other things in line, like his nutrition, his water consumption, um, his you know, general stress management, the less load that's going to place in the whole of his body, as we saw on that slide. So when it actually does come to the point where he's got to stay up late, he's doing long hours you know, late into the night, his body's going to generally be more resilient. He's got more space in his tank to fill it up with a bit of stress than you know, if he's not been doing these things all the time. So it's just trying to you know, remove a lot of these things out as much as possible so when the time comes that you know, he has to do it, there's, there's room there to do that. Mm. So really what we were talking about very, um, you know, quite a while ago now was how to prevent these injuries and this is what we really look at and can we change the intensity of playing so that they're doing some gentle playing and then some quicker playing and then some new techniques and mixing it all up so they're not just sitting playing for hours and hours at a time. Instrument and technique changes, can you actually play sometimes on the old instrument and then onto the new or can you... Um, vary the, the position, so you're sometimes sitting, sometimes standing, etc. New repertoire, can this be brought in gently rather than having to learn it for a performance in a week's time? And this again isn't always possible. A violinist that I'm working with, she, she had to learn a concerto and she was performing it and recording it and that was it. It was um, someone else had dropped out, it was her big chance and so she had to do it. So this is all in an ideal world and obviously you have to move within real life. Um, unrelated activity or emotional stress can't always be avoided, but where you can. So if, if you're moving house, don't do that just before you go on a big tour or don't start lugging boxes and doing, you know, building just before a big tour. Do you know what I mean? Mixing things in so that you can, if there's a big emotional stress going on in your life, be kind to yourself and try and get earlier nights or try to eat more healthily and... Um, instigating sensible practice techniques and we've heard from Matt that he used to play a lot more than he does now 
And are you just playing the same things over and over and over again because you feel that you need to, because otherwise people won't think you're good? Therefore, can you actually only practice sensibly? There's John Williams, an amazing guitarist, who, who says, you know, he, he actually practices off the instrument a lot, a lot. So this is a new idea for many musicians where they can actually think of the, the type of music they're trying to portray or the phrasing or the imagery or the emotion behind the music, practice fingering techniques off the instrument, practice shift changes off the instrument underneath the table so that when you're on the violin or the guitar or on the drums, you can practice tapping rhythms, you can practice all sorts of things not sitting at your instrument. And um, gradually increasing intensity and duration of playing, we've spoken about maintaining instruments so that if there's a key that's always getting stuck on the piano or if the violin bow needs rehairing, you're not actually struggling with this instrument. And interspersing practice with other activities. So can they do some sort of gentle exercise? We tend with musicians not to get them doing very, very high level kickboxing or you know, very physical things because it can be quite dangerous, but things like Pilates or yoga or swimming or gentle jogging um, is really good for getting cardiovascular, getting um, blood flow and actually getting them out of positions that they've been sitting in or standing in for a long time. So stretching up, stretching back, and getting blood flowing and also often socializing with other people because it can be quite a solitary occupation. So once people have had a time away from the instrument, you really need to grade them back into playing quite gently. And it's not just a matter of saying, oh, just do a little bit and often, because these people will just sit down and play for four hours and lose track of the time. So what you need to do really is get them to keep a journal. And it's a bit like when we get people to keep a pain journal or when we're retraining um, children with writing, you say do so many lines per day, etc. And initially we might just literally do shadow playing where you're just doing the motion and you're just doing it without the instrument at all. And then you grade up gently, gently, gentle, simple, slow, soft music, not really tricky rhythms. A patient I had yesterday, I mean, he's had so many problems and then he said, I just keep trying to play for one hour the piece that brought on the pain. And I was like, really? That's ridiculous. You know, like he hasn't played for, for months. And we've been trying to get him as one of your patients, Lucy. Thanks. And uh, so he's like, and I'm just like, why, why are you trying to play for an hour when we've gone through this graded thing and they, they just want to get back into what they were playing? And it's about talking to them about the fact that this is going to be a graded return to play, that they will get back to that level, but they have to often take quite a step back. And it can at times feel quite demeaning for them, I suppose, to play things that are below their normal level. But often people say that they practice techniques and that they develop better technique and that they can work on better approach to their instrument whilst doing that. So if you try and turn it on, the, on its head so that they, they can really get something out of it and benefit from better technique, um, then, it, then it can turn a bad into a good. Also, you just if, if they are getting pain, dropping back one level rather than dropping back altogether and stopping. So edging up, up, up if there's a problem, dropping back. Then edging up, up, up if there's a problem, dropping back. And um, then having short breaks in between every 20-minute practice session. So here's Matt with his rock tape on, and um, he, he loves this Thanks photo. Again. Yeah, that's all right. So what, what makes practice, um, you know, that old thing of your mum saying, practice makes perfect, go and play your scales. And over practice does not make perfect. Often you can practice in errors. And if you're practicing with sub-maximal movements or if you're slumping because you're really tired or if you're exhausted and your body actually just needs a rest or you just need to have some downtime and a good steak, then it's not going to help you heal and it's not going to help you practice or be an effective musician. So warming up and cooling down. Matt now does a lot more warm up, cool down. He's stretching and you can warm up and cool down off the instrument as well as on the instrument playing short sessions rather than long sessions, using a relaxed frame of mind where you're actually thinking positively about the music. So often if people are in pain and they're playing with a lot of tension, they can begin to hate what they're doing rather than enjoy it and trying to bring back the enjoyment to why they are doing this activity. Positive thinking that they will get better rather than thinking that they're never going to play again. 
Mirror practice is a good one, or getting people to film you on, on their camera or on their phone so that you can see if you're using unusual postures or if you're using a lot of wrist flexion to play or kinking your, your neck over. And freedom of breathing, and we talked about that before, about using intercostal diaphragmatic breathing. And really, often people, when they're very tense and if their shoulders are raising, they stop breathing, and then you're not getting all the oxygenation to the tissues. So performing arts medicine is a really interesting area. It's become a very popular area in, I'd say, the last 10 years. And sports medicine has, has definitely been in the fore. And now I think performing arts medicine is also catching up with its own masters in performing arts medicine at UCL. And many textbooks now are particularly um, written on this topic. And it's a very multidisciplinary approach to teaching and training and working with these with these patients. Often you're working with the music teacher, the instrument maker, sometimes a psychologist, a physiologist, nutritionist. So it can, it can be quite a broad group that sometimes we dip into with other patients, but sometimes not. Hand and arm pain is very common. Playing conditions are often not good and musicians are often not properly prepared for the stresses that come on from being a professional musician and the, and the emotional demands that come with this as well. And prevention is the, is the primary aim, and so really looking at how to use your instrument and how to keep a healthy body so that you can relate to your instrument and, and, and produce great music that people enjoy and that you yourself aren't in agony whilst you're producing it. So I think we've had quite a, quite a broad array of, of discussion, and what I'd really like to do now is open it up to... <coughs> to the floor for questions to, to Matt, to Graham, to myself. Um, and if any of you would like to discuss anything particularly, you know, if, if you want to raise patients that you've had with similar uh, conditions. Yeah, Mark's going to bring the microphone. Just where There were a lot of people who wanted to come tonight who couldn't come, so we're recording this so that I can send them the lecture. Where was this match? Uh, that was at Stonosphere Festival um, two years ago, I think. In Germany? Yeah. Yeah. And as usual, I'm not in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any questions? Yeah. Um, just about ultrasound. <laughs> um, <coughs> What specifically did you ultrasound with Matt? Was it to do with sort of tendonitis or so we, was we, it, were you sort of identifying areas of pain and looking at it from that perspective? Yes, we use a lot of Travell and Simmons techniques where you're looking at um, myofascial tension and trigger points and referral patterns. So we were looking a lot at brachioradialis, extensors, common flexor origins. So we were ultrasounding more further up the forearm, so more on the muscle bellies. Yeah. So we found the trigger points and we were ultrasounding the trigger points. Do you think there's any benefit, because um, obviously you said he had like all the nerves out, do you think there's any benefit with doing like nerve gliding kind of exercises? Or he did them, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, I didn't write that on there, but yeah, he definitely did those on the nerve glides, yeah. Definitely. And would he have tolerated like he had um, the what for oh, like night the time. Yeah, he had those. Yeah. What I did is after every gig, I wrapped my <coughs> both arms up in towels, okay. and I got I was seeing it to gaffer tape them up. So I just literally sleep like that on my back like a vampire, <laughs> which is very difficult. Yeah, you need the toilet in the night. Well, I just didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And we did give him the. You had you you didn't find. The I sleeping's still them, an issue for you. I found them very uncomfortable. We yeah. tried the, what, what are they called, those Yeah, elbow the elbow, elbow pads, yeah. And I found them very uncomfortable, which is why I reverted to the towels, because the towels went from there to there, whereas those just started there. So I, I could still bend my arm with those, but with the towels, can't really do that. So, yeah, yeah the, towel, the towels worked better for me, and I had the towels on the wrist splints on as well. Yeah, and I think the um, if we were to make bespoke thermoplastic ones, I don't think he would have used them to tour with and everything. No, because no. they don't look yeah, very cool. both arms and <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah. You it's found the wrist splints useful for sleeping because yeah, wrist splints are very good. Yeah, yeah. but I, I didn't. 
I didn't really have a problem in the wrist then, it was just kind of in case, because sometimes when I used to sleep on my hands, I would wake up with a wrist problem. But, yeah. yeah. But we find often patients, if they sleep like so, then they're putting their extensors on strain. So if you um, uh, place the wrist in a neutral position for sleeping, you can offload the extensors and really change the, the pain cycle quite effectively. So we use night splints quite I did long. actually try taping my arms to the mattress as well. You've never I told me that. <laughs> I didn't want to tell you just in case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in case what? Just in case it was wrong. <laughs> it is wrong. Thank you. We take the whole of you and take okay. your mouth shut soon. <laughs> okay, cool. okay. Any other questions? Um, which aspect of the therapy do you think may be this impact? Probably, probably the stretches, to be honest. Well, actually the tape as well. Because I, the tape, I didn't think the tape was going to work. And uh, I was quite negative about the tape. And the rest of the band were as well. It was like, it just looks a bit stupid. But then you had skulls and things on it. That's the thing. And that's why a lot of our fans thought I was trying to make a fashion statement. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, can you, uh, can you sign a piece of that tape? Yeah. So in the end, I was, we were kind of selling the tape off. Didn't tell you that either. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we were giving the tape away. But no, the tape definitely helped, but I didn't want to become reliant upon the tape. So I'm kind of in two minds whether to use it on the next tour in April, but I'll probably try not to. So you weaned yourself up? Exactly. Yeah, I've, I've weaned myself up. And the other thing is it's very difficult to put the tape on yourself because you've got to stretch it out in certain th <laughs> ways. So, yeah, I, I couldn't do it myself. Basically. Your singer was helping, wasn't he? The singer yeah. was trying to do it, but he was no chopping good. it up, really. He wasn't like Lucy? No, he wasn't as no. good as Lucy, no. <laughs> Thanks. Can I just ask with the tape, what, sort of what um, direction were you taping and what were you sort of taping over? So you were doing, you doing the extensor train, so dropping into, actually dropping into like a stretched extensor position yep. and taking it on a relaxed position first of all and then that tape's got a 25% stretch to it, so we then stretch the tape up and we take it all the way back. Yeah. Which is why you can't do it yourself. It's a nightmare. I tried. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty impossible to do that particular train mm. on your own. Mm. How much did you look at um, core stability and, and posture and general upper body strength? We were doing isometric strengthening towards the end. When he was in so much pain, we were just trying to get the pain down. Um, in the end, his symptoms have settled. We, we didn't look at that a lot, actually. I, I kind of rectified that myself. Because you were doing I, jogging and I did a lot of exercise. research myself, and you know, you, Google's your best friend, isn't it? To some, to some degree. But <laughs> I, I was slouching a lot anyway, so I sort of made a point of sitting upright a lot more, and that has helped as well. So, yeah. We do look at that with other patients. I think Matt, Matt's been on tour a lot as well, so, and he's not, we don't, he's self-managing mainly now, so we're not seeing him on a regular basis by any means, but I think he's a, a friendly face for something like this, and also we, we worked with him right through, but he's also very self-directed, so he, you, you started doing a lot of exercise yourself as well. He was also, he used to do the building and um, so he's, it wasn't something we looked at with him, but like this violinist that I was working with today, we're doing a lot of Pilates based exercise with her because she's very forward and she's, and, and you think of her instrument, she's very forward and actually a cellist yesterday, they're very forward as well. So I think it depends. With, with drummers, they tend to sit fairly square because they're using their feet and um, yeah, posture wasn't so much of an issue. Weirdly, with one of the biggest problems that, we, that I have now and I've always had in the past is not so much the arms anymore, but we, it's a thing in the band we call metal neck from head banging because you're constantly going like that. And the next morning you wake up and you say, oh my God, all of us are like, how's your metal neck this morning? Yeah, good. So we wander around the hotel like this. So the neck is almost more of a problem than the arms at the minute, mm. really. Yeah. Oh, see, see that, that tomorrow. You yeah, <laughs> you haven't told me that either. No, <laughs> well, these surprises. Any other questions? Just what you were saying about the violinist earlier that had like the wide neck. Would you advise her to buy another like? Because it's difficult when patients come in and you think their instrument or their tennis racket or whatever is the problem, 
Do yeah. you go out and advise and advise for the needs? Obviously, it's the cost for the patient. Well, no, I mean, if a violin can be 80,000, 100,000. Mm. So if they've just got a new one and they're in love with it, you yeah. certainly wouldn't say to go and buy another one because you'll never see them again. Yeah. Um, they, you can work with them if they're buying a new one to advise as to the, the appropriateness of that instrument for their body. However, some, some instruments are just innately unfriendly to any, any mm. person. This woman actually is going to be fine. It's just because the span, she's quite slight, and because it's slightly bigger, and therefore the pressure that she has to exert with the, uh, the fingers is, is harder, she just needs to strengthen up. So she'll be fine. Um, you often find with guitarists the, the, the neck span means that they can um, really clench more with their thumb or that they, they hold their wrist in more flexion. So. Yeah, you can talk to them about their instrument. For example, with flutes and things, you can get keys modified. With bassoons, you can get keys put on to, to decrease the span. But you've got to be quite careful on how, how you talk yeah. about that uh, because it's, it, it's the, the value of these instruments is sometimes very high. Mm -hmm. But modifying them, for example, putting strapping around a stick or um, changing, uh, for example, on, on a bow. At the end of a bow, you can often use coban tape. Um, or you can use gut strings on a violin to decrease the pressure if you're rehabbing someone after they've had flexor tendon surgery, for example, um, so that they're not playing under such tension on the strings. Um, you can make modifications like that. You can actually shave off part of the neck of violins and guitars so that you can decrease, but you're changing the instrument, so you've got to check that you're not going to change the sound, although the sound box itself is the box rather than the the um, fingerboard but yeah I think you talk to them sensitively and then you work with them and the instrument maker if you do need to require you know the changes are appropriate yeah I have a question about children um, so when you work with sports children and it's a unilateral sport you often try and do loads of bilateral activities and get them out of you know that pattern and switching arms when you're rowing how, how do you deal with that, with, say, the violin or a flute? You know, because you can't yeah. change the arm. You can't change the arm, but you can get them doing other activities that take them out, and that's what we were talking about, different stretches, so that you're actually moving them out of fixed patterns into the opposite position that they're fixed in. So, yeah, you have to work on that. So if violinists are clenching up here, how, how do you get that down? How do you get bigger movements here? Because they're usually like this. So how do you get them reaching up and back? So you do look at that so that you don't end up with a very asymmetrical posture. Yeah. Yes. There's a question for Graham. I was just interested, would you suggest as a rule it's a good idea <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for patients with some element of nerve problem to take a B complex? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I generally try not to. Uh, I you know, try not to recommend vit specific vitamins because I try and work as much as I can with the diet and potentially. For those of us who don't have access to physiologists, <laughs> patients and access to dietetics uh, is think, another issue. Yeah, I mean, if you've got access to diet, I mean, it's a question for your dietitian really, and if they they know. Um, it's just I'm not really I'm not qualified to actually recommend vitamins, so I don't I don't work with them. Um, just try and work with the diet as much as possible to to get that in best order to support them, you know, through that through that way. Um, I think B6 and B12 has been indicated strongly in the literature to help with yeah. with neural based problems. Yeah, it definitely. definitely. Yeah. Complex. As a rule, <coughs> I mean, generally, so it isn't contraindicated, yeah. but something we can only recommend is something they explore. Yeah, and I recommend it a lot. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, generally, <coughs> yeah, a lot of be you know, people's, <coughs> or you certainly read a lot about people generally being B vitamin deficient. Mm -hmm. That's you know just <coughs> through alcohol consumption. Yeah, um, but yeah, the more you can kind of if you can get that. You just balance up the diet out more, get you know, get some more proteins, get some good quality carbohydrates and fat, it will help. I mean there's you know, I often say to people there's you know there's no point, you know, building a house and putting a terrible foundation in. Uh, and the diet's really the key for things like supplements to be able to do their job effectively. Uh, I mean it is what it what it is, it's a supplement. So it's just trying to, to, to get the diet a little better first and then yeah, if there is a specific need for a B vitamin, 
um, then yes. Um, just one final question. Would you have a physiological sort of figure for the impact of smoking, as in the negative impact? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Sometimes we're trying to encourage patients to at least cut back. <laughs> um, I, mean, it's a I generally don't lecture patients about smoking. What I try and do is just improve other areas of their health. Mm -hmm. And you often find it, uh, that you start to work on multiple areas of their health and they start to feel better. And actually, the, the smoke. So yeah, and, and the smoking they stop by themselves. It might, it's no good, you know. Just find that actually telling people to stop. There is there is a, a link between say smoking and back pain, for example. I mean, you can explain that to people, but are they going to change those habits as a result oh, of? I'm just interested. Are you aware of the percentage of physiologists in terms of tissue healing and slowing? No, I couldn't give you one. Yeah. But um, I, you know, I try and again explain the the overall load it's going to place, added stress on the system, and that if they would you know, cut back, it might help. Um, Just bearing in mind increasingly hand surgeons will not do elective surgery. Mm. Mm. I can't remember the answer. Well, thank you especially to Matt and to all of you for coming tonight, and I hope it's been interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.